use this. Okay. So uh, this weekend, staff, I was sharing, you can see what we do in staff meetings. I was sharing a, a YouTube video with the staff um, that a friend, of, a friend of mine from Georgia did, a Southern comedian, Anita Renfro. Um, she first gained national attention years ago with her mom song that went viral. It's set to the tune of William Tell Overture, and the mom song essentially condenses everything a mom's going to say in a day to two minutes and 55 seconds. <laughs> the same could be said of dads or any other parent figure. We don't have time to play it here, but I thought I'd give you a little bit of the sample. Forgive me for not carrying the tune very well. But here it goes. Play outside. Don't play rough, would you please pay fair? Be polite, make a friend, don't forget to share. Work it out, wait your turn, never take a dare. You'll appreciate my wisdom someday when you're older and you're grown. Can't wait till you have a couple little children of your own. You'll thank me for the counsel I gave you so willingly. But night now, I thank you not to roll your eyes at me. Get an A, get the door, don't be smart with me. Get a grip, get in there on the count of three. Get a job, get a life, get a PhD. I don't care who started it. You're grounded until you're 36. Get your story straight and tell the truth for once, for heaven's sake. And if all your friends jumped off a cliff, would you jump too? If I've said it once, I've said it at least a thousand times before. You're too old to act that way. It must be your father's DNA. <laughs> Okay, that's enough. You can catch my news. But we've heard them all, right? And we've probably said them too. Although I think there was probably a time in our life we swore we would never say those things. We do. I remember I used to cringe every time my mother came out of my mouth. Um, now it just happens all the time. But our kids don't always want to do what we tell them to do. Heck, most people I know don't want to do what I tell them to do. <laughs> Present company included. <laughs> At least not without question. Why? Even because God said so doesn't work. So today's gospel lesson makes absolutely no sense to us when Jesus tells, not asks, but tells, two fishermen, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, follow me and I will make you fisher of men, fisher for people. And without question, they drop everything, leave their nets, and follow him. And then Jesus finds two more brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, also a fisherman, and they blindly follow him too. Not only leaving behind their boat, but more importantly, leaving behind their father. Um, Dad, uh, I know this is a little bad timing and all, but Jesus just asked us to follow him, so we got to go. Um, poor Zebedee. You know, Dad's left to do all the work and pick up all the slack. And I kind of imagine that Zebedee is standing there speechless for a moment, thinking, what just happened? And when he finally does find his voice, I can just see him screaming out after them. If Jesus asked you to jump off a cliff, would you jump too? <laughs> when we hear stories like this, we think, thank God that will never happen to me. <laughs> we feel no pressure, no fear. Jesus isn't going to find us in the frozen fish section at Cub Food and ask us to abandon our shopping carts and set off for parts unknown. It just doesn't happen that way. We have choices, right? Well, of course we do. But to expect Jesus to be passive in our lives, to let us do whatever we want to do, is delusional. God is more powerful than we give him credit. Jesus calls, they follow, and we tend to give the fishermen all the credit, right? 
what strength, what courage, what faith they have to drop everything, leave everything, sacrifice everything to follow Jesus. But this story is not about the power of human beings to change their lives. This is a story about the power of God to walk right up to a bunch of fishermen and work a miracle, creating faith where there was no faith and creating disciples where there were none. This is not a story about us. This is a story about God. A, riot, a reminder for us, God can and will break into our lives and shake up a thing or two. So yes, we do have a choice. But if God wants something done, God will be persistent, possibly even a little pushy. I watched a podcast interview this week between Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, and his girlfriend, Danica Patrick, who's a race car driver. Um, and Danica interviews him and ask him about his relationship uh, to the church and his faith. And when he was younger, he had a strong faith and the church was a big part of his life. He went to church every Sunday, he went to Young Life on Monday. But since then, he has left the church. Leaving because, he says, he did not see a connection to life and his Christian upbringing. Church was not valued welcoming, he says. Young life on Monday, welcome everyone. Come as you are. Church on Sunday was make sure you dress a certain way. Don't bring that person. What will people say? And he also struggled with church doctrine and policy, saying rules and regulations and binary systems don't really resonate with me. And because church is binary, it's us and them, it's the saved and unsaved, it's heaven and hell, it's enlightened and heathen, it's holy and sinner, these are all his words. I don't know how anyone can believe in a God who wants to condemn most of the planet to a fiery hell. Let's be clear. Rogers is not describing this church, and we have God to thank for that. He is not describing Lutheran church doctrine, nor who we are as a community of faith, nor the God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. But his reasons for the leaving the church, I hear a lot, especially from youth and young adults. Our youth and our young adults are leaving the church at an alarming rate. 59% of millennials raised in the church have dropped out. 35% of millennials, their adults aged 22 to 35, have an anti-church attitude, believing the church does more harm than good. Now we can rationalize and say, oh, they'll be back. And I gotta tell you, more so than ever, no, they won't. Jesus is losing his followers. Research indicates that young Americans turn from religion <clears throat> is a huge problem for them. Teen suicide, the opioid crisis, and social isolation are crippling our young people on a scale like we've never seen before. Most young people make decisions without thinking about the consequences. They make forever decisions about life and see those decisions as temporary. Jesus is losing his followers. And yet a significant body of literature suggests youth with high religious commitment do better on almost every level. Lower use of drugs and alcohol, less promiscuity, fewer instances of depression, lower suicide rates, higher grades in schools, all those things. But these effects are strongly tied to re regular participation 
in a religious congregation. So the main factor isn't religion per se, but rather the experience of growing up in a community of caring adults. Jesus is losing his followers. Now knowing he would not be around forever, Jesus started calling ordinary people, you and me, to help nurture and care for others. We have God-given instructions and God-given gifts to help. Jesus needs us. Jesus is calling us. Our young people need us. Our young people are calling us. Quietly, yes. But they're still calling. Some even crying out for help in difficult ways, and it worries me. I always tell the young people who work for me at Chick-fil-A that I'm just another adult that God put in their path to tell them their parents aren't as dumb as they think they are. <laughs> that someday they will appreciate their parents' wisdom. And I think our young people need adults, other than family members, other than parents, to mentor them and guide them. They need to hear, get a life, get a job, get a PhD from other adults. I love this year what our confirmation class is doing. Each confirmand has an adult that is shepherding, helping shepherd them through the process. And it's so much fun to hear about and see the meaningful relationships that are growing. But how can we engender a love of Jesus within the hearts of our young people? Because the love of Jesus will help them stay. It's what keeps all of us here. When an adult introduces a young person to Jesus, and I mean really introduces them, they come to realize Jesus is someone who really loves them, really longs for them to be close. Disciples grow. They are not born. They are befriended, listened to, valued, encouraged by those who have befriended and heard themselves. Faith is caught, not taught. It is witnessed to, not merely explained. They stay, and we stay, because friendships are formed, and friendship and intimacy with believers leads to friendship and intimacy with Jesus. This week I ran across an article written by a young college student called Why Generation X Should Give Religion a Second Chance. And it does provide hope. I wish I could read it all, but here's kind of a, a shortened version. It's a young woman. I am five months into mononucleosis. Rather than enjoying my senior year of college, I spent most of my time on the couch. Exhaustion threatens to overwhelm me constantly. Perhaps I seem at a low point, but I am not. I find myself at the center of a community that constantly reminds me that I am loved. Every day, I laugh at a funny card or hear the ding of a text asking how I am. My church family mourns with me when I become sicker and celebrates when I enjoy renewed energy. Because of them, I do not feel so isolated. When I feel most down, their kindness lifts me up. She says, my friends and even some of my family don't understand why I love church and invest in a relationship with God. But I think if they understood what it's like to have an army of people to cheer you, to mourn with you, and above all, love you unconditionally, they would want a church family too. I need religion because my church and the God, my God, remind me of my identity as loved. When I cannot love myself, and that happens, 
I'm surrounded by a community, a compassionate community, and a God who do it for me. If I could ask one thing of my generation, it would be to set aside our negative experiences with faith. Forgo the isolation that has become familiar and give religion a second chance. You don't have to commit to a God you don't know or trust. You can just be enjoying, just enjoy being part of a community that sets aside superficial differences and tries to see one another as beloved. No strings attached. In a world that judges us on likes and filters, I want everyone, her words, to experience what it feels like to be loved for nothing less than being a child of God. It's incredible wisdom. And that's what we strive to be for, for our young people, for everyone, really. You know, and if we told them once, we've told them at least a thousand times. Jesus loves you. We love you. We have to keep telling them. And more importantly, we have to keep showing them. Amen.